background's just a little messy. I'm um, just going to do the entire screen because I'm going to be tabbing in and out. Um, okay, here we go. So there is my messy, messy screen. I'll just go like this, and then we'll open up the presentation. Is that okay? Hopefully not too bad. Okay. Mm, it's not that fabulous. There we go. Okay. Um, great. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Merci beaucoup. Um, yes, my name is Jen, and I'm a cloud developer advocate lead at Microsoft. I'm on the academic team, which is a wonderful place to be. We have a fantastic team of cloud advocates, and we're all about students and educators and teachers and anyone who's interested in learning about, um, about the cloud, about the web, about all the amazing things that you can do um, from Microsoft student ambassadors and all the way up to grad students and faculty and grad um, in, in big institutions. So it's a real honor to be here. Uh, bonjour Lille, I've actually never been to Lille, but someday, someday we can travel again. So let's talk about Omromani. So you say, quoi, um, we're going to talk about making pictures with your hands. And it's a fascinating and ancient art. So I'm going to invite you to please extinguish all lights and get ready to take a magical journey with me as we learn how to make stories with our hands and how to, to cast those shadows on the web. So we're going to be making virtual hand shadows. So I figured since this is all about web stories, let's actually make some web stories and uh, and push the push the push the envelope a little bit. So I'd like you to prepare for some magic here in Boston. Um, it's an, it's nine in the morning, but I think in in France it's the afternoon. So maybe grab some tea, turn out the lights, and let's think about how we can make stories with our hands. So I've been traveling for a long time, um, especially in Asia. My husband's Chinese, he's from Beijing, but we've also been to various places in China. Um, I wanna show you a little video from Sichuan. Um, Sichuan is fabulous, of course, because of the food and uh, big giant pandas rolling around in the snow and um, some really beautiful landscapes. Um, and they also have and this is all, all the way throughout China, but there's a tradition in China of these lovely little tea houses. And they're kind of, they kind of act like variety shows that, that people are sitting around eating tea and having little snacks. And there's just entertainer after entertainer comes and just does a little, um, like almost like a vaudeville show. There's, it is a very old tradition. Um, there's stand up comics and it's in interesting because I don't understand much Chinese, but I could understand the jokes. Um, there's also a tradition of one person here and one person standing behind with back to back. And the person in the back is telling a story and the person in front is, is acting it out um, improv um, improvisationally. Lots of really interesting traditions of this kind of vaudeville show. The audience is basically not paying attention most of the time. They're chatting, they're making a lot of noise. But here's a marvelous example of the ancient Chinese folk art of omeni, of hand shadows. So I'd like to show you just a clip and how this looks.
So this just gives you a little taste of um, this kind of really interesting and magical uh, folk art. It really draws you in and it makes you believe. And he's doing a really um, something, well, a couple of interesting things. I think he's behind the screen. I think they're pointing the light, even if it's natural light, through that, that little screen. And, um, and he's casting his shadow that way. That's a little bit different technique. Normally you're in, you have a candle in between, uh, you're sitting in between yourself, a candle and a wall. So you're able to cast your shadows on the wall by means of a candle light. Um, he's also um, including his own face, which is um, a little different. So a little unusual and cool. And, um, and he's using two hands, so I'm going to come back to this idea that you need to be using two hands in your own Romani. But I wanted to give you some uh, a, an idea of um, how nice this can be as a, as a folk art. Oops. So. so I'd love for you to come with me and indulge your cottage core. I don't know how many people are on TikTok. I am JavaScript auntie on TikTok, if you want to follow me. I love TikTok, even though I know it's for the kids. But, you know, I'm an old, and I still love TikTok. I learn all kinds of things on TikTok and one of the trends is cottage core. So it's all about going back to basics, going back to, you know, living living with candles and um, uh, in one with nature and pressing flowers. And uh, I don't know about the skateboard, but uh, a, a lot of, you know, this kind of um, back to basics, pioneer living, as we would say in the US. Um, so indulge your cottage core, I love this fashion. This dress is $400, by the way. Uh, it's a retreat back to the back from from what we're facing now, back to nostalgia. So I would love to invite you to just grab your sunbonnet and let's go. Um, so this is very little house on the prairie. Um, I I grew up in the seventies and this was the fashion. But, um, well, not the sunbonnet, but the big prairie dresses was a big deal. So um, let's 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 go back to nostalgia. I took a look at when people started writing about shadowgraphy and about um, this fashion for shadowgraphy or en Romani, uh, the, the English word would be shadowgraphy. Um, and there's several books written in 1859, 1860, again in 1910, 1920, 1921, and then again in 1970. And I'm trying, I don't know what I think of this slide, but I started looking at the dates of when hand shadows were, were fashionable uh, in the West. And it seems like in times of strife or when people are really looking to escape, hand shadows become fashionable. So I think, you know, here we've got the Crimean War in the, in the 50s. In the 60s, we've got the Civil War over here. Um, 1910, you're getting ready for the Spanish flu and World War I. Um, we've got the 1920s of like complete escapism and trying to, you know, the, between two wars. And then in 1970 in Vietnam for us, uh, that was, um, that was uh, a moment. I really think in the 70s, people were trying to escape. Definitely all the prairie style. And part, part of it for us was in 1976, it was our bicentennial. So there was a lot of kind of back to colonial living. Um, I, I remember this very, very well, even though I was only six, but it was a very fashionable thing. So I just wanna gently think about when shadowgraphy is fashionable and maybe suggest that it's time for a comeback. Maybe it's time to make this thing fashionable again because we're in the middle of a pandemic. I don't think this thing is ending anytime very soon, even though the vaccine is here. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moment where people are looking to escape. Witness TikTok. TikTok is the perfect escapist app. I think hand shadows are a terrific way to, to escape a little bit. So how do you cast hand shadows in real time, in real life? So you, you take a box light. You see how this gentleman has a box light and a, there's a candle inside of that. And then they've made the aperture small and circular. And then the person's standing in between the light and a wall, a blank wall and casting shadows. And um, there are some exercises you can do to warm up when you want to start casting hand shadows. And this is actually really hard, <laughs> but if you can do these exercises, you know, to try to warm up your fingers. So I would encourage you, you know, before we do our demo, warm up your fingers. <laughs> it's not easy. Oh yes, these two fingers have to touch and then you can try to make these shapes with your hands. So um, while I'm speaking, warm up your hands. You're only gonna need one hand, unfortunately, for this demo, but that's okay. And then a little more history. Ombre Chinoise was brought to France in 1776, interesting date for the US, um, probably from China, and it was popularized by a guy from Angoulême named Félicien Trewe. 
1848, and he died in 1920. So he was really at that moment where um, where it, it, this became a big fashion, and he was um, instrumental. He was a magician, and um, and he wrote a book about about it as well. So this is kind of the ultimate ephemeral, low tech, high art, folk art type of type of activity. And um, what was interesting to me was to experiment a little bit with light and the best way to cast shadows. And I found, you know, don't bother like when you're kids and you're doing this with a flashlight on the wall because your mom thought you were sleeping, but you weren't. You were casting shadows and scaring your little little brother, a little sister. I was the little sister. My brothers would, you know, yeah. Um, just try this at home with just a little candle on a blank wall uh, in pitch black uh, room. It, it, it works really well. So this evening, just light a candle and try to cast a shadow. Really the nicest experience is just with a candle. It's, um, and it makes for a very atmospheric activity. A scary dinosaur or a giant goose. <laughs> so what I suggest is that we try to breathe new life into this art form with technology. We are technologists, we are web people. What about this idea that you could save a shadow? What about sharing a shadow? Let's give it a try. Let's give it a try. Let's build a website and use some machine learning, because why not, to cast shadows. So if you start Googling, um, Googling with Bing, as we say at Microsoft, uh, hand shadow, or, sorry, just articulated hands or hand, um, hand mimicry or hand casting, articulated hand tracking, there is a lot on the web out there because this is kind of a big deal. This is kind of an important activity in, in gaming. It seems to be quite important so people can follow their hands when wearing like a HoloLens or, or, or you know, in VR or AR, following your hands um, and, and, and manipulating objects. Um, outside of the gaming um, world, you can also maybe do flight simulation and figure out where to or, um, or in the health field to use your hands and figure out exactly what instruments you should pick up and what you should do with, with this and that to try to, you know, make, um, to try to interact with a virtual world. So this is old, 2014, but Microsoft was doing fully articulated hand tracking back in the day, kind of interesting. And really there are a lot of hand tracking libraries and workshops and lists. Um, there is a whole topic on GitHub on hand tracking. There is um, one of those awesome lists, so awesome hand pose estimation with a whole bunch of stuff. There's a challenge on figuring out what to do with hands and how to manipulate. Really a lot on the web, so you kind of have to sift through all of these um, opportunities to, to tackle this concept of hand shadows. Um, and just to elaborate a little bit on hand tracking, the uses of hand tracking, yes, for gaming, we talked about that, for simulations and training, um, but also for hands-free um, remote interactions, like this example, he's um, able to scroll virtually on the web um, just by moving his, his hand, so they're watching the motion of the hand go up and just scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Um, assistive technologies, you know, can you do things with your hands that would allow you to interact with things virtually? Of course, there are important and amazing TikTok effects. There's this um, this trend where you have you show your hand, and there's a, a filter that um, that shows um, a screenshot of your choice or an image of your choice, and then you can swipe it away. It's a good way to present content. Um, there's a, <laughs> I'm not going to show this. <laughs> it's kind of cute. Um, so I don't know. Um, our good friend Donald Trump used to have a habit of going like this when he spoke. He, he has a very strange way of gesturing as he speaks like this. So people made um, a pretty hilarious demo called Accordion Hands. So, you know, <laughs> he was like playing an accordion. <laughs> so, hey, it's nothing if we can't laugh, right? Anyway, we're done with that. Um, so that's good. Interestingly, hands are really complicated things. There are 21 points on a hand that you need to be tracking. It's kind of interesting because when you think about it, you've got... You know, a thumb has one, two, three, so that's two, three, and four, and then the base where, where you can actually also track, that's that number one point. And then the wrist is zero. Then you can also detect a palm. I think that's what TikTok is probably doing. They're just checking whether there's a palm and, you know, adding an image to, to, 
to the palm. But each finger has, you know, a lot of, of articulated moments, a lot of points where you can where you can manipulate. Um, so there's a I'm going to share these slides um, and they're on the repo, which is open source. But um, you can take a look at some of these research papers about how to figure out the points of a hand and what to track and how to manipulate. So to use hand tracking on the web, there are two main libraries. I'm going to just hop over to uh, show you what they are. The first one is TensorFlow, TensorFlow.js. TensorFlow, um, the TensorFlow models make use of MediaPipe, which is kind of the gold standard in hand tracking. They've done a very fine job in, um, in uh, hand tracking. They also do full body articulation, so the entire body, which is split off in TensorFlow. In TensorFlow, they use um, a pose net for just the 20, uh, uh, 17 body poses, and then they do a separate model for hands. MediaPipe has done both, so they take hands plus the body poses, and you can have something pretty sophisticated um, being, uh, being tracked. Um, there's a library called Finger Pose, which is for sign language. It's very specifically, I'm not sure, but I bet it's only American Sign Language. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not very good at finger spelling. I used to know how to do this, uh, to spell my name is J-E-N-N-Y. Why? Why? I can't remember. <laughs> um, and anyway, so that is um, something to explore. But there's a new library called Hands Free JS. So I'm just going to pull up these uh, websites. So this one is TensorFlow. And this is their article on their blog, Face and Hand Tracking in the Browser with MediaPipe and TensorFlow.js. So they have the facial recognition, they have hand pose, and then they have, that's face mesh, and then they have pose net for the body. Um, funnily enough, their demo is down. So if you click over to hand pose, you're going to get um, an error. But we won't bother. Yeah, that's the error. So. Google, let's fix that. <laughs> um, MediaPipe is a company that seems to be working with Google. I believe they're affiliated with Google, if not acquired by Google, I'm not sure. But they are doing very sophisticated work, like I said, with this hand pose, and you can do two hands at a time, which is really, really nice. They also have a special model just for palm detection. They have their hand landmark, which is this bit. And then um, they have a, a lot of nice sample code that you can that you can look up. And then there's a brand new um, library here, taking MediaPipe and translating it for the web into a, a NPM package. It's handsfree.js. Very very promising. Um, I talked to the guy who's running this uh, online and. He's really doing a good job, and we talked about like the differences between TensorFlow and MediaPipe for hand tracking. He's trying to find a, a common ground between the two and make it easier for us to use. Like, take a look at this TensorFlow hand pose um, bit here that has a, a different sort of. Um, he's not using the Canvas API. He was recommending using SVGs to um, to, to do things with the hands on the web. Lots of good, um, really promising code. This is pretty new. After I wrote the talk, I actually found this, so I'm excited. Good to see these things being pushed forward. So there's a technical challenge here, which is that palms, palms are harder to detect than faces because faces have a lot of points that you can check. You can check eyes, nose, you know, lips, ears, um, but palms are just kind of a blank slate. I mean, we're not doing, you know, palm reading, which is another fun thing to try. You can do that with apps. Um, I should do a demo. Um, but anyway, so that is a, technically it's more challenge, more challenging to just detect a palm, interestingly. And hands have more data points than bodies, like I said. So there's 21 for one hand versus 17 for a body. And the more data points that you have that you need to track, um, the, the more weight the model is going to have. So it becomes harder to use it uh, in the browser. Another thing is hands come in all different sizes. Um, so there are, you know, it's, they have to just make sure to catch all of the little points. So I would love to, I don't have a child available, but I'd love to track their hand. So um, you can do that in, in my demo um, and send me your results. My kids are all grown up. Uh, and the data set that they use to create um, these hand pose models is gathered from real world images and also synthetic rendered images. So it's kind of interesting how they, they worked through figuring out, you know, the differences between reality and synthetic uh, rendered images to create a, a 
a performant model. Um, so media pipe, like I mentioned, it's used by TensorFlow.js, and um, it's using multiple machine learning models. It's using a, a, a model called Belay's Palm to get the palm detection. It, re, uh, it returns a hand bounding box. It's like there's a palm and here's a hand. Um, the hand, mark, uh, hand landmark model operates on a cropped image region and returns 3D hand key points. And then it's efficient because it's using these two models. It's grabbing the palm, and if there's no palm, it just stops. But if there is a palm, then it continues on to detect a hand. So it's using two models, and it reduces this need for data augmentation um, for cropping and rotating and scaling. Uh, and then, oops, sorry. Uh, it can detect its capacity towards prediction accuracy. And then the pipeline is implemented as a media pipe graph. So there's a lot of complicated technical stuff going on to create the model and then to render it. Um, and it's really useful and interesting to take a look at some of the papers that are written on this. Body posing is completely different. It's, it's a com done in a completely different way than hand posing. Who knew? Fascinating. So the trick is it, to make the best hand shadows, you really need two, two hands. Did you, you remember, you know, to make a bunny properly, you know, you want to have a little bit here, maybe a little tail. Um, Media pipe allows for that which is nice, um, and TensorFlow.js does not. It only has one hand to keep the model size down. Um, but unfortunately, MediaPipe does not allow you to style the shadow hand. Uh, it, does, it, it, it expects you to be rendering the hand the way it ex wants you to render, and it doesn't give you a lot of creative freedom to get away from the canvas or to, to really leverage the canvas API or do more interesting things with it. It kind of locks you down a little bit. So unless we want to reverse engineer MediaPipe, which I'm not eager to do, um, I would just please ask TensorFlow.js to give us two hands, please, please. If you're listening, I'm a GDE. <laughs> Let's go. Um, because we need to tell stories with our hands, and it's important. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to try TensorFlow.js. We're going to hope for multi-hand support soon. We're just going to do hand shadows with, with one hand. Because like I said, MediaPuck doesn't allow the styling of the hand skeletons and its purpose is really more mechanical than artistic. And um, TensorFlow allows you to just do whatever you want with a Canvas API. Although it is a good suggestion to try maybe something different like SVGs or something. So let's go. What we're going to build is a virtual shadow graphy show. So we're going to open up the webcam cam to show our hand poses and we're going to cast those poses styled like shadows onto a canvas. So we're going to allow the user to record these shadows as a, a story. So we have three tasks. So let's do this. <laughs> so there are a couple of design and architecture decisions that you're going to be needing to make. You're going to need a base architecture. You're going to need to manage that webcam nicely. Implement your hand pose um, and get the model to give you key, the key points. And then draw what it looks like. Um, you're going to need to then cast your shadows onto yet another canvas, and you're going to need to deploy this whole web app so that your friends can use it too. And I've done all of these things for you, um, so I hope you're grateful. Anyway, so let's talk about the design and the architecture. Uh, I have some code snippets here. We'll just walk through these. Um, I am a Vue developer, so I tend to do everything in Vue.js. Well, recently, I've been using Vite, which is amazing and fast. It's amazingly fast. Um, if you take a look at the code base, you'll see that one of my components is really large. I think it would benefit from an upgrade to Vue 3 with a, the component API. I haven't gotten around to it. I welcome pull requests, however. Uh, if you would like to take a look at the first piece of um, any application, I always go to the package JSON. You can see your dependencies. So here we have TensorFlow, and there's a bunch of installations. TensorFlow.js has broken up their package so that you need to install the, hand, the specific model uh, that you need, which for, in our case is hand pose. Uh, and then you need TensorFlow.js so that you can use that model for the web. You need then several backends to be installed as well. They've broken everything up into backends. I'm going to use the WebGL backend. And uh, then you need the core TensorFlow.js package. I used Bulma for styling. Use whatever you like. And then there's a couple of view packages. At that point, you need to think about how you're going to set up the view. So this is a pretty simple two-page app. You start the show, and then um, you, you, you welcome your users, and you click, and then you start the show. It's only two routes. 
So on the second route is this big component called show view. And the first piece of the template is this video tag here. <clears throat> so this is where your webcam is going to be cast. And you can see that there's, um, there's a canvas, an output canvas, that lays on top of the video canvas. And you can see how this looks. So I'm going to show myself in my hand. And then that output is going to be where I draw the skeleton. Then here, I have the shadow canvas down here, which is next to it. And I'm going to, I'm going to take my key points and re-render them onto the shadow canvas. Um, and play a little bit with um, the Canvas API, limited as it is. Uh, we do the best we can. So uh, you're going to see in the code base a lot of asynchronicity because these are relatively heavy models. Uh, and the reason TensorFlow has not released double hand poses, I'm sure, is because these models are just pretty big. And um, I think they're trying to uh, be a little bit respectful of, of the, the browser needs. Remember, 21 key points. You know, that would be another uh, 42, as opposed to a whole body, which is just 17. So that's a lot. It's a lot of key points. So I always um, mount my uh, processes asynchronously, load up the model, and then, you know, just wait for that to load, and then set your message to say, okay, model is loaded. Then I'm going to start up the webcam. So first model, and then webcam, and then I'm going to start looking for a hand. Uh, when you're setting up your camera, just make sure to handle any unavailable cameras. Always work asynchronous, asynchronously. So here we're grabbing our video as a stream, and we're starting to um, capture the keyframes. And for each keyframe, we're going to add 60 FPS. We're going to be um, drawing and redrawing and redrawing your, um, your, your skeleton hand, so, which sounds scary, but it's not scary. It's cool. Um, then you need to design your hands and design your shadows. And this is interesting because you would think that out of the box, TensorFlow.js would say, okay, um, here's a hand. I'm just going to draw you some key points um, automatically. Um, fortunately for us, that's not the case. And the reason it's fortunate is that we can then really um, play with the way we draw our, our skeletons. So um, here I have the, the the first skeleton being drawn right on top of my video. So I draw a clear rectangle so that I can see the video through this overlying output box. I set the stroke style to red and the fill style to red of the lines that I'm drawing. And, and then I flip it around so that the hand matches the video. Uh, and then I do the same thing for the shadow box next to it. So um, I'm going to be uh, casting black shadows on a white background. So um, so that is, you know, the, the, the amount that you can kind of play with a Canvas API. Uh, Canvas API has a, something called Shadow Blur, and I set that to 20, and you can play with that. It would be kind of cool if I um, added a slider in the, um, in the web application to maybe, you know, tinker around with the Shadow Blur and the Shadow Offset. If you add the offset, you're going to have the, um, the actual hand here. And then the shadow is going to be offset so that you're not going to see the hand. So the hand is going to be in white. The shadow is going to be in black. And, um, and the background can be white. So the hand kind of hides away. And then all you see is the shadow. So, um, so that's how we're going to kind of simulate casting shadows. Because luckily, the Canvas API has a shadow um, capability. So for each frame in the webcam, you're going to draw your key points. And here's where we're starting to make predictions according to the model. It's estimating the hands and figuring out where the landmarks are and then drawing the key points. So it's going to take the key points for each, um, for each um, animation frame and draw it both onto the um, output of the video and also to the shadow canvas. And you have to clear each time. <laughs> Now this is interesting and also lucky because TensorFlow.js gives us a lot of um, a lot of flexibility. Um, you are going to create your hand by setting the ind indexes, the, in the indices. And I tweaked this because if you saw, if you remember, the original hand is like a line all the way to the wrist, line, 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 and it ends up looking like a garden rake, you know, <laughs> when you um, when you when you cast the shadow. It wasn't very pretty. So what I wanted is I wanted to redraw it so that the palm is more like a square or a polygon 
and then I would just draw the indexes. So I changed um, the, the palm to, to, to not come to a point, but actually to go around. So that's nice that you have that flexibility to draw to Canvas with the uh, points of your choosing. And then, you know, you're going to have this palm area drawn out as well. Okay. So then we have to figure out a way to tell our story. We've got our video loaded up, we're getting our keyframes queued up, and we're showing our skeleton hand and our shadow hand here. We have to figure out how to tell your story somehow. Well, I went ahead and created um, a speech-to-text implementation using Azure. Why not? Um, using Cognitive Services speech-to-text. And um, this was kind of an interesting and fun uh, experiment. I've never dealt with speech-to-text using this type of thing. I know that Leonie did a talk. I believe that the, the API she was using is um, text-to-speech, and it's looking for um, groupings of words to, to check for. This, of course, is using machine learning, so it's really you know a text detection. It's a, it's a full-powered uh, cognitive service that you can use. You can set the language, and I regret that I did not have time to make a switch to switch English to French. Maybe I'll add that um, after this talk so that you can um, test your tell your stories in English or French. Right now it's set to English. Uh, and yeah, you can just go ahead and create this cognitive service and, and allow your story to be captured and drawn to the screen along with your shadow. So you're going to connect to your speech service, which is a cognitive service, and you need to store your key somewhere, um, the key that I just set up in that cognitive service. So I took the key and I posted it into um, the Azure Static Web App, which is where this whole, this whole show <laughs> is stored. Um, and it's very helpful that you can just create a little API for yourself just to grab the key so that you don't expose your key anywhere in your code base. You're going you're gonna to save it. Uh, in your configuration in your Azure Static Web App. So it's very helpful. So I just use Axios to get the key to the cognitive service that I set up. And then I'm configuring, configuring the um, audio and starting the recognizer once um, my, my subscription has started up. Um, and the recognizer has a couple of methods. One of them is recognizing. So this recognizer recognizing will give you what it thinks it's hearing. As, you, as it goes along, as it's listening to your speech. But I chose recognizer recognized because what it does is it, it recognizes words and then the, rec it, let me say that again. The recognizing method just takes the words that it hears, but recognized takes the words and assembles it into a sentence that kind of makes sense as according to what it's hearing. So it really is a smart uh, machine learning uh, based cognitive service. Um, it works pretty well, actually. So um, it's just um, asynchronously, start your continuous recognition asynchronously. So it just listens asynchronously according to the speech service you set up. So that's pretty cool. So then we have to figure out, once we've got our shadows cast to the screen and we've got our speech being picked up so that we can um, write the story to screen, we need to find a way to somehow save and um, and, and share the videos. So I tinkered around with this a little bit. I didn't, I, I originally had a little download method. It didn't work great in Firefox, so I ripped it out and I just had the video being shown under the story so you can at least replay it and show your whole story as it's written um, to, the, to a user. And then you could probably, you know, export that video and paste the story into an email and send it to someone else or, um, if the story's short enough, or maybe just take screenshots uh, and post it as a tweet. So if you feel inclined to do this and if it works for you, use the hashtag show me a story and create uh, a shadow story for me. I'm really curious to see what you create. And you can fork this repo and do whatever you like. Last thing I needed to do was a deployment. So it's going to live somewhere. Let's just go ahead and post it up to Azure Static Web Apps. Um, Azure Static Web Apps is going GA. Um, pretty soon, probably for build, which is in May. Um, and I'm pretty excited to, um, to use this. I'm starting to post all of my code into that static web apps. It's a really nice service for Vue, for ViewPress, for um, your static sites. And there's a very nice implementation with Visual Studio Code that you can do. 
if you have the Azure extension in Visual Studio Code, you can just you know create your static web apps and just pop it up. And it's still in preview, but pretty soon it's going to go to GA. So this is a really, really helpful way to manage your um, Azure functions and then your static web apps and push everything to production right from within Visual Studio Code. That works really well. So I encourage you to try. So now, the moment you've been waiting for. If you're looking to become better at hand shadows, because I know you all are, the Ballard Institute and Medium, uh, a Museum of Puppetry has a nice YouTube channel, and she gives good tutorials on how to make um, hand shadows. So if you would like, you can go to um, AKAMS Ombromani. The code base is AKAMS Ombromani-code. Hashtag show me a story and go ahead and, um, and create your ombre menu. So I'm going to just reduce the size of this and open up this link. Let's see. So the trick with giving a talk like this, which is already using my webcam, is to use a different browser and try to queue this thing up. Let's see. This is my Wi-Fi. Okay, here is the app, and you can see it's an Azure Static app. And um, this is the first page, so we're just going to enter. And here comes the model. That was pretty fast, actually. That's good. And here's the video. So please do not freeze. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to hope that everyone can see this. I'm going to tell you a story. So um, let's make sure that we can cast our hands. Yes, we can cast our hands so you can see the shadow. And you can see how I redrew the, um, the palm here, because normally it would be like all gathered here. Oh, that was interesting. Ooh. <laughs> anyway, good fun. Yes, so TensorFlow, just one hand. But that's okay, because you can see how the shadow is cast onto the shadow. Um, and you can see right there, you can see the white uh, casted shadow, uh, the white hand, which is hidden against the white background, but it's covering up my hand because I'm, I'm over here against, against the edge of the screen. I'm going to go back over here. So show me a story. I'm going to tell you a story. So we're going to go like this. Um, you can probably hear my husband teaching across the wall, but we'll try to, <laughs> I'll try to tell you a story. Okay, so I'm going to start recording, and let's see if we can capture a story. So watch for the speech up at the top. Once upon a time, there was an egg. It was a beautiful egg. Its mother named it George. One day, the egg started wiggling and jiggling and oh, out popped a little creature. And it looked around, and it looked around for its mommy. Mom, mommy, mommy, mommy. But its mom was nowhere to be found. What kind of creature was it? Was it a goose? Was it a duck? No, it was a baby dinosaur. So it cracked out of its leathery egg and found its feet and lifted its head and went to find his mommy. The end. So here is the story that I just told. And here is how I can play my recording. So you can see, once upon a time, there was an egg. It was a beautiful egg. Its mother named it George. And one day, the egg started wiggling and jiggling. And out popped a little creature. Let's see if it captured everything. Oh, here comes the little creature. It's wiggling and jiggling. And here's the little creature. There's a little creature. There it is. Mom! <laughs> so you can have some fun 
with um, telling stories on the web and saving to uh, saving from Canvas to um, to video just by using a couple of lines of code. And um, I would love to get your ideas on the best way to share this. I always love the idea of creating um, creating like greeting cards, like a, um, a grandparent in this pandemic could you know create a little hand story and um, and share it to a grandchild. And um, and I think it would be really really fun. So I'm just going to leave you with the little dinosaur who walks away to find its mommy. I hope it found its mommy. I think it did. But maybe you can tell that story on your own. So that is Ombre Manich. And I'm very, very grateful that you gave me the opportunity to create this talk special for this uh, Web Stories conference. So I'm just going to wave. Bye. But I'll hang out for questions.